Michael Greenwood, welcome inside the Brooklyn boardroom. How are you? Hey, yeah, very well, thanks, man. Yeah, thanks for having yeah. me. <laughs> Not like we already we didn't already have a pre-conversation. We had a warm-up huddle a moment ago, so so <laughs> hopefully you feel very warmed up. But um, but listen, as I mentioned in our warm-up, you're the first guest we've ever had from Europe, but better yet. Not just Europe, but from Monaco, Europe. So this is, I'm feel very special. I can, I can feel the, the wealth all around you right now. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I, I wish I had a better view view for you from my office. But, uh... No, no, Orgy Hepburn. I mean, you, we can't do better than that. I mean, we were talking film business. You know, she was a, a lightning rod of an actress back in her day, which, which would be what? I don't even know what the... 50s or 60s, yeah. 40s, 40s, 50s, anyway. 40s, 50s, 40s, 50s, yeah. So, um, but no, 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 this is this is great. I mean, look, we if people want to see what Monica looks like, they can Google it. You know what I mean? Go on yeah. Google Earth. <laughs> you know what I mean? Figure that out. Um, and if they want to talk to a mono a mono cast, mono cast, right? If they get that right, mono cast, then mono it guess, would yeah. mono get mono gas. Then, I, as you pointed out, it would not be you because you're not officially a mono gas, even though you were born in Monaco. You, you're not able to have that as part of your your, your pedigree because your parents were English. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So you need the you need mom and dad to be um to be yeah. a local uh, to get yeah. the, the They really gypped, they really gypped you out of that thing, man. You know what I mean? You could have yeah, won one of the six. Man. You could have been one of the six thousand residents, one of the six thousand natives. You know what I'm saying? So yeah, yeah uh, I'm lucky. Nah, but, uh, nah, it's all good. I'm just teasing you. Um, no. but yeah, so. So Michael is a, for those who are just tuning in, Michael is a sales, sales executive with Daro Films. Is it Daro, just Daro Films, nothing additional to the title, uh, Daro right? Film Distribution, but yeah, Daro, Daro Films. Daro Film Distribution. So he sells, you know, film content, TV content all throughout the world, literally in various film markets from France to Italy, to Germany, to Africa. And he's um, joining us today to kind of help us break down how the international sales business works and as well as just provide some insight on the current landscape in the business since there have been so many shifts and changes. So, and I think, as you mentioned, Michael, you started your, you started your career at Daro and you've been there the entire time of your professional career, right? Uh, yeah, exactly. So um, I went to, I guess that must have been 2011 or something like that when I, yeah. when I started uh, right after university. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, I've been, been here ever since and been, I've been lucky that it's quite a, a nurturing environment, even though it's obviously very challenging, but I've been yeah. able to have access to, to a really good group of salespeople to, to help me kind of like learn basically. We didn't cover this in all of our conversations in the past, but I'm curious to know also, did you go to college with the intention to land in a company like this? Or is this like a fluke job you ended up with? So it's a bit of both. Um, I mean, I studied business management. So Mm -hmm. uh, just to have sort of the, I think that opens a lot, a lot of doors. So I did my bachelor's degree in business management, but I also did a bachelor's degree in film studies. So I did two at the same time. Mm-hmm. And the film studies one was a lot more uh, hands-on, so it was more camera work. There was mm. really not that much about the film business, uh, other than you know explaining uh, the transition from classical Hollywood era with the studios and the distribution means till today, where everything has changed. Yeah. Um, that's the kind of only business side of things that I learned from university, as a, as it applies to the film business. Mm-hmm. Um, and then basically I just came back to, back to Monaco for, for, for the summer to, you know, chill out, look for a job, find mm-hmm. what I was going to do next. And yeah, I was just lucky enough to see the interview, um, the job application. Uh, I think I saw it on, on the radio. So I had it on the radio or something and decided, yeah, I'll just, you know, that, that sounds like me. I've, I've wanted to be in the film business. I studied business and film. So it makes sense to, to at least apply. And yeah, got, I got lucky. Uh, wow, wow. Yeah, because I have to imagine, I mean, you know, I don't know how many distribution companies exist in Monaco, but it can't be that many. Right? Uh, I think definitely the only one uh, at the time that I applied. I think wow. since, since then, there's, there's two or three other companies uh, who have uh, set up here. Yeah. Um, but, you know, a lot of the, these kind of distribution companies, especially with the scale like Doros, where they, we do have sales representatives taking care of, uh, sales all across the world. Um, Monaco is, you know, it's, it's more practical to be based in a capital city. Mm. Um, so being based in Monaco, I think, is just purely because the the, the boss uh, started the company here, and wow. um, 
So I think it's just, it, there, there wasn't a real reason for moving to Monaco other than that's where the boss is from. So that's why uh, the company's from here kind of thing. So. And speaking of Mr. Daro, just out of curiosity too, but also maybe this helps add some context. Was was his career, I don't know if I mentioned about his career, but was he always a film executive sales agent or did he have a previous? Uh, so actually Daro is the, um, it's, uh, so the company's founded in 1982 by a guy called Pierre Rochat, who's the boss you met yeah. uh, in uh, last yeah. time you came to visit. And his yeah. wife, uh, who's um, basically Monique Davenet. So the Daro is uh, Rocha Davenet, and that's the, course, the name, their names uh, for the name of the company. Um, and I think, if I'm not mistaken, he used to work for FIFA, was his first. Oh, um, I think I remember this now. This, yeah, yeah, it was his first sports. sort of film job. Um, and before that, I think he, he worked in a, in a different field. But uh, yeah, he, he did have, obviously, uh, experience in the business before he uh, uh, launched his own company in 82. And help us understand where you guys fit within the world of international sales distributors, companies. For example, you know, are you one of 10 or 12 mini majors? Are you on the boutique, boutique side where you're really small? Obviously, I don't think you guys would be obviously at the scale of a, a major major like a because other no, big companies no, no, no. are just reaching like a Sony. So help us understand kind of where you fit in the ecosystem and kind of who surrounds you as competitor. Well, I think we're, we're, we're relatively small in terms of employees. We have 16 people. Uh, mm -hmm. But obviously, since my boss's experience has been so, um, you know, he's been in the business for so long, uh, 38 mm -hmm. years running his own, his own company. I wow. think that the, rep the reputation Dara's, Dara has built up is, is quite strong. So um, I definitely wouldn't say that we're in the level of a, you know, a, a Sony, Disney, Lionsgate, yeah. those kind of guys are, yeah. are definitely huge. But, you know, I think we have a good reputation and, mm -hmm. and I think we, we place pro probably in the, in the top tier uh, of independent distribution companies without, without uh, sound, like trying to sound uh, too braggy. Uh, no, it's totally. I think we, we do okay, uh, but obviously it's... Uh, it's a family run business. And I think that it's quite a, you know, we're a humble bunch. Uh, I think it's just that uh, we do have a pretty good reputation in the business, I would say. So for scale and context, it'd be safe to say you're obviously one, maybe one or two clicks below a mini major like a Lionsgate, right? I would say one quite clicks a few clicks below. Few clicks below. I mean, I mean, but Lionsgate okay, so huge. Big, huge. Okay, so let's say five clicks below a Lionsgate or a legendary but like probably what two to three clicks above a boutique boutique and i can't give you a name but like a uh yeah i think that's probably a fair place to yeah, to, to, yeah. To, to to say that i mean we do have content all over the world we are the leading independent distributor in africa um mm. in terms of i think in terms of how many hours we have but there's mm -hmm. obviously others with more but we have experience there since 82 my boss has been dealing with pretty much a lot of the channels there so i would say that yeah depending on the territory we do we do sort of we are like yeah five clicks below lines gate is probably yeah decent, yeah I'll just, uh, i don't know just, it's, hard to, just, it's hard to define it's hard to make it because one of the things that's challenging for most consumers as well as even even professionals in this business we don't do distribution is is that you know these companies aren't household names like studios are because even yeah. even you know you know small studios that make films, even financiers, participants, but you don't know the, the, the distributors, the, the brokers. So it's like, there's very few that I, I can't think of any off the top of my head. I think it was one French company. It's eluding me at the moment. That's a household mm -hmm. name. But can you just drop a couple of names of the people that would be orbiting your world company? Well, I mean, we're, we're a B2B business. Mm -hmm. So um, re realistically, the the public or the audiences will yeah. probably not know our name or will That's have never heard thinking. of us or yeah. you know whereas Lionsgate you you know their title card from from the beginning of one of their films yeah. because they're a major US distributor but because yeah. we're kind of a middleman um, yeah. it would be very hard for the audience to to know who See. we were and yeah. that's why I would put us in the list of, uh, of a lot of companies who, who are not broadcasters, but who are simply distribution companies. Yeah. Um, but it's hard for me to, to name drop uh, anyone yeah. in the kind of vicinity because realistically, I think everybody has their expertise 
Um, yeah. So that's Every, just hard everyone's to say. everyone's unique, and no, there's no such thing as a broad brush to paint you all by, right? So I that's fair. Yeah, that's yeah. fair. That, that's very fair. Okay, so let's jump let's jump into this a little bit. So uh, you you've explained to us that you know you got your start at Daro. Um, you studied. You, I think you got an MBA or the equivalent of it in uh, bachelor. it? So bachelor's in, in BSC. business. BSc bachelor's in business, and you studied film as well. Um, and then you got started in the business. So I'm just curious for those who may be thinking they want to be brokers in that space, education wise, or even career experience wise, is there anything else that you would recommend that they, they pursue to prepare them for that journey? For example, you don't have an advanced degree. Maybe that's because you didn't need one or because mm -hmm. you felt comfortable already in the space, but you know, what, what do you think? Well, I, I think I, I, I'm quite a unique case in that like I got quite lucky to to um, to get to get pretty much the first job I applied for outside of wow. university. It actually it actually is the first job I applied for and I got it I got it straight away after I think like a week after the interview. So I was wow. very lucky. But wow. I started out just uh, as an assistant, uh, replacing one of my colleagues who went on maternity leave. Mm -hmm. And um I was lucky that I was given quite a lot of responsibility in that uh, six months period when, uh, so I had to take over obviously the, the assistant roles, but I was also taking part in a lot of negotiations with uh, mm. the team who ran Russia at the time. So I got lucky that I was put in the deep end. Wow. Um, and so when she came back, um, I think that, uh, so the, the boss was like, well, why not give you a shot? Uh, and make you sales um, for a, for a smaller territory. So I got I got wow. given after kind of after, the, after six months. Uh, after six months, not full time, junior, obviously, oh, okay. um, oh, yeah. with wow. with supervision and with help. But uh, yeah. pretty much uh, after six months, my role was was moving away from uh, from um, from the assistant type yeah, role more stuff. into junior sales yeah yeah uh, which was very lucky but uh, obviously it, it, it wasn't a, a very developed territory i had to do a lot of the work to find the contacts ah, and develop the relationships but that's ah, the best way to learn uh, was being given in fact the territory that wasn't um developed and being fought for so i could make my own mistakes and build my own contacts Okay, so a couple things I want to understand with that transition or that pivot in your career. One is, what do you identify as the skill or the aptitude that helped them distinguish you as someone they can trust, right? But the second thing is, is that you, and we didn't cover this, but I'll just drop it. So you, you, you're fluent in, you know, obviously English, uh, French, and I think you said some German, but you were given Russia as a territory to develop. Uh, no, so I, I was uh, assistant in, in with the Russian team because Russia was already a massively developed territory. Uh -huh. I think my first uh, thing was French-speaking Africa, which I was. Oh, given. okay. So, okay, so um, you're familiar with that language. I was wondering, how did you adapt to a yeah. language and a culture that you? Was, was uh, yeah, because yeah, yeah. I, I was fluent in French, and they were like, right, someone needs to. I mean, as territories go, it's one of the most complicated to do sales in. Mm -hmm. uh, for a variety of different reasons, um, but uh, that was a place where I felt that it's impossible to kind of make too many mistakes because yeah. uh, you know we did, we weren't distributing a lot of content and it was all uh, to be done. So in a way, if I made a mistake, then it wasn't um, you know it's not too bad. It, it's a good place to learn because we didn't have anything set up. Not not so a lot to I, lose. I had to do that. Not, not a, a lot, lot to lose. lose. A lot yeah. to gain. Lots of game. So, so are you saying, Michael, you're single-handedly responsible for developing French speaking Africa for the market? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Uh, no, yeah. no, no, that's yeah. not, definitely okay. not. Uh, we we had a guy who used to handle it uh, sort of yeah. uh, 15 years before I joined, uh, yeah. but obviously none of those, you know, and then it was left by the by the by the side because it it just wasn't a very um, easy territory to sell to, and it's complicated to to. Um, to get consistent business. So I think it was more just like, right, try your hand in that place, rebuild the database, make the connections again, see what happens. And just coming full circle on that experience and the, this theme of the discussion, today, French speaking Africa, how vibrant is it? I mean, is it relevant still or is it? Is it it's still it's still relevant. It's better than where it was when, uh, before I took it over, I, 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 yeah. I hope, but uh, it's yeah. definitely still a very, very complicated territory. So I'm wow. happy that I've got. I was given more uh, to 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 do along the way. So now I, I'm I'm actually in charge of uh, Benelux, Scandinavia, English-speaking Africa, 
uh, French speaking Africa, Far East, Australia, New Zealand. So that's, well, that's a, that's a, that's quite a big, like a, uh, a lot on your plate. That's yeah, a, it's a lot, lot of uh, different spaces. Yeah. So, so help us understand what your role actually is in covering all these various territories from, you know, the, the thing you, the things you do from a day-to-day -day basis, the tools you use, the, what you're expected to deliver. What does that look like for a sales agent at your company? Um, well, let's say like uh, my job is basically to help sell our catalog. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, using, I guess, pretty much whatever tools at your disposal that you can. I mean, now we've got Zoom, which is coming in as a new tool that that uh, we're obviously using right now, but is a practical yeah. tool for, for doing business in times of COVID. But um, definitely just using basic tools, which is uh, your pitch deck, your mm. screeners, which you send to clients. Uh, mm. Obviously, Excel files can be, you know, used. So it's, it's pretty much, it's quite basic in terms of, the knowledge that you need to have to run uh, sales from a computer standpoint, I suppose. We also have our own systems that we use mm. to track the rights, keep track of sales, uh, keep track of acquisitions. Um, all the metadata is obviously saved in there. So if I want to create something, I'll use our system to create a catalog to send to a client. Um, so I think it's 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 not nothing too complicated in terms of what someone needs to know um, uh, in order to be able to use those uh, those tools. Uh, mm -hmm. The most important thing is that uh, you really need to um, maintain and develop your network. So you need to meet clients, try and know as much as possible about the market by following the news, reading all the dailies. You know, keep keep up to date on what's going on. Um, obviously I have to listen to my clients, keep track of what they might want in the future, as well as push what I have now. So I think that's I kind see. of encompassing the role, but obviously it's a team job because we have, um, you know, we have five different, um, uh, offices here to yeah. help us. So we've got a finance team, legal team, operations, acquisitions, and then us in sales. Okay. So let's do this. We're going to take it out of the abstract and bring it into a concrete example. So you mentioned clients, you mentioned data, you mentioned library, you mentioned networking, and you mentioned developing a, a market through research and resources. So, but bring us from point A to point Z. So for example, your product is your library and your content. So how does the content go from this particular uh, production company mm. or broadcast? You know, so you take it from, how does it go from this person into the distributor's hand, I mean, into an exhibitor's hands or a, a broadcaster's hands mm. and the, the major key steps along the way. And in, so, starting with um, how, yeah, the pitch or how it comes to you. Well, let, let's say that like uh, we first have an acquisition component before we start selling, we would buy whatever the product is. So either mm. in, 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 uh, in our case, we, we do a lot of um, library titles. So films mm -hmm. that are, that are already 20 years old, but uh, who have a great cast and mm -hmm. are probably still destined for a good shelf life in the long tail value of the film. Um, so that's kind of where we come in. But just to give you the better example is we also finance uh, TV movies. So that would be a brand new film um, mm -hmm. that would generally be in the States, uh, a broadcaster like Lifetime or Hallmark. So just so that you're familiar with the genre. Um, yeah. So we would partner up with a producer. We would basically come up with the um, the uh, financing from the international market, and mm -hmm. they would come up with the financing from the U.S. and, and Canadian markets mm -hmm. by most likely by selling directly to the network. Um, and we we do it a variety of different ways, but partly pre-sell and partly uh, just cash upfront, basically. Okay. Um, okay. And then that film, once it gets made, is delivered to us. So let's say it's brand new. Then at that point, we can start the cycle of sales from from the very beginning, which is reaching out to everybody individually, um, pitching the film. The, I mean, in this case, it's it's very uh, genre centric. There, there's a lot of romantic comedies and a lot of daytime thrillers. So mm -hmm. there's not so much difficulty to pitch a film individually because it fits very nicely in an existing uh, niche. Mm -hmm. um, so I would just send out an update to my clients. Uh, maybe there's an opportunity for a deal with the same client once or twice a year. 
so you mm -hmm. have to kind of pick your time to group to group the picture in with with another few films to hopefully make a, a decent package mm -hmm. um and then that's repeated throughout every geographical territory of the world if we can as much as possible um, at least as many as many territories as possible that you can sell then that's sort of our mission okay uh, is to do that I'm going to I'm going to run through a scenario you correct me where when, whenever sure. I kind of go off script right so film producer A said you know he ha he has an idea for a Hallmark film he he has a script he has talent attached and he knows Daro does financing distribution and yeah so he says he gives you a call and says hey my, obviously it may not go to you it may go to Pierre or someone else but he gives someone the your organization a call and says hey this is the movie, this is the pitch, or you come to a meeting. Um, this is how much I, I project it's going to cost to produce. I need, how much can you lend to this or invest in this? You guys say 50%, 75%, whatever the number is. And he says, great. I'm, and you guys write a check. He goes off and shoots it, brings you back the movie and says, here it is. What do you think? You say, it's great. Let me now take this to um, the Hallmark type buyers to license it potentially or what you guys could probably end up doing is um maybe even before well yeah is that so is that fairly accurate uh, fairly accurate minus the one part where the producer and oftentimes would because it's a domestic producer oftentimes mm -hmm. that we work with us or canada mm -hmm. they would do the deal in the us we would come up as you say at the, at the point where he's like right uh 50, 50 or whatever the the, the, the split is we yeah. would take international. He would go off and make the film, but he would be responsible ultimately for selling it to the uh, to the U.S. network. But he Got might decide it. to do that uh, at the beginning to get his financing on his Got side it. sorted out. Got it. Got it. So he comes to you with already with some pre-sold aspect of the territory, and his yeah. and he's already raised some finance. So maybe it's a gap of thirty percent, whatever the gap is. He's like, hey, you guys take international, fill in this gap I have in the budget. And you guys make your money out there. I'll make my money over here in the domestic, and we'll be happy when we price, right? Give or take, yeah. Give exactly. or take. Okay, give or take. Now, the alternative scenario that you operate in is this library business, where let's say, for example, Warner Brothers says, "Hey, you know, I have, you know, I have all of these. I don't know if this is accurate, but uh, Raiders of the <clears throat> are '80s '80s movies that you know I, I would love to get out, generate some income from them. While well, you guys are willing to take X amount to to broker sales." for these titles in these international territories. And you guys say, yeah, we'll do that. And is that fairly accurate? Uh, well, so, well, not not with Warner, but you're, 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 you're definitely in the right kind of um, area with uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark. I mean, obviously yeah. it's, it's a massive film, but we would be after that kind of gem, I would call yeah. it, like a classic. But we, yeah. wouldn't, we wouldn't take every market in the world. This is where we would take our, the markets where we are the strongest and where we know that we have a market for this kind of film. So. Um, you know, uh, somewhere like uh, English-speaking Africa, where we have the 12,000 hours, we yeah. know that uh, there's a demand for films with great casts who are just great films who are timeless. Mm -hmm. We know that we can pick we can pick that up for an upfront fee. We'll just pay you, um, you know, I'll pay you uh, X, and I get 10 years or five years of distribution rights. Um, and at which point, you know, once I make them, once I make that money back, uh, mm -hmm. then we split is is a, is a common way of doing that. So, you know, yeah. there's three types of, of, of deals that we could do that. But the idea is that like our track record in sales would um, would show that you might trust us since you've seen that in the past we can deliver. Yeah, uh, and that's yeah. where we could we could go after, let's say, uh, um, those films and, and and hopefully do well. But it's it's a tricky market, obviously. But uh, we. Um, that's just a good example to, to, to define. And just going to put that in, going to put that in a bucket too, and just put some wrapping around it for, for those listening. So the scenario we're talking about is again, you have a gym, someone comes to you with a gym, like Raiders of Lost Ark or a library or things like that. You're like, yeah, we know where to sell these. We know we, we can, um, find a great licensees or broadcasters for it. Let's, we, you're going to say to this guy or this person who owns this company, here's a guarantee of X amount of dollars. So they don't have to worry about making the money. They've already made their money. And then once we hit, and once you guys, once you, your company generates a certain threshold, oh, well, better yet, once your organization get, generates that equal, makes enough money that equals the guarantee, then the mm -hmm. two parties, your company and the other company, begin to split the revenue generated from your licensing of these titles in these territories. 
almost, but we we okay. it's breaking point plus our commission because we don't okay. work for free. Yeah, so right. it's almost yeah. right because we paid you the money up front. We took the yeah. risk. We make the money back that we paid you plus we make our commission and then yeah. we then there's a split of some percentage involved uh depending on whose favorite it is depends on the film and how easy it is to you know how, how big of a film is it yeah of course okay just make sure I, I we do a primer on that because i know this could be a complicated thing to understand if you don't understand distribution and sales so but thanks for pointing out the commission so so my question to you now getting into what's going on right now in the market so how would you compare the state of the international sales market today um prior to COVID 19 versus years ago I mean, it's definitely been changing even before COVID. Um, mm -hmm. so, I mean, when I joined, it was already changed. Let's say mm -hmm. uh, the DVD business was was well, the VHS business was gone. <laughs> all the old technology is gone. The physical market was already going. Um, there was a few. I mean, there was a very very big golden age when when DVD was was basically right after the theatrical market. You try and release on DVD as soon as possible that's now virtually gone. And I think COVID is probably going to kill the last markets where where there's still a little bit of, of DVD sales going on, minus a few exceptions for, for other mm -hmm. reasons that, you know, internet's not necessarily accessible, so it might be an option. Um, but yeah, definitely, I think that that's what is going to be um, one of the big changes that, that's happened before I even joined the company. Uh, since since I've joined, we've seen an incredible rise in VOD. Mm -hmm. um, so VOD is people like your Netflixes, your iTunes, your basically anything that's video on demand, that's not linear, mm -hmm. that you can mm -hmm. watch whenever you want. That's really exploded as we, we thought it would. Um, obviously, the finance uh, situation is not quite caught up with DVD sales. You know, we would okay. definitely have expect to make more money from a DVD um, than we would uh, from VOD today, depending on the project and depending on the market. Yeah. Um, but that's something that that's also ha had to make everybody adapt to what kind of films they're making. Mm -hmm. um, whereas we used to be able to, let's say, make a, um, a very strong straight to DVD title that mm -hmm. probably wouldn't carry the same weight on a VOD platform as, as, it, as it used to um on dvd so that's something i think is quite interesting to, to to see a direct effect of um such a massive change in consumption habits having an effect on what films are being made totally i mean and without the, the truth of it is too without the original i mean without the films without the content there is no business at all right so yeah. if yeah so obviously you know longer COVID or longer COVID impacts production the more impact it has on all the companies in the ecosystem because you can only recycle the, the 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 library titles for so long i mean you can only watch raiders of the lost ox you know two or three times you know and then you're like okay well, um, yeah, yeah give me yeah. another game of thrones so so what yeah. are your predictions yeah you know what i'm saying so what are your predictions for covid's long-term effect any, any i mean um, the, the interesting thing is uh, obviously just uh, it's something that i'm not too familiar with because we don't deal with theatrical projects as much but that's where I've seen the biggest impact, let's say, that's that's going to be um, visible to everybody, even if you don't know anything about distribution. You'll see that no one can go or no one has been able to go to the cinemas and the films who have been released have, have done very, very poorly um, mm -hmm. because just simply put, the cinemas aren't open or aren't widely open. Yeah. So all these big films, James Bond, you know, the next Fast and Furious, all these big franchise pictures, who are supposed to make billions of dollars uh, have been pushed off the schedules uh, because the cinemas aren't open. So do we think they're going to open again in time for a lot of these releases? We don't know. How much of an impact is that going to have in the years to come in terms of everybody having to shift the launch date of their films? Even if people get back into production, they're going to have to delay the launch uh, by at least as long as um, you know, whatever that film is takes to be released. So when James Bond is released, then whoever slot they took has to probably wait that kind of um, time. But then the thing that I find that could be the most significant impact that COVID will have is that um, it seems that the studios are, get, are brave enough or, or smart enough to have done big, big scale TVOD launches. 
mm. uh, on transactional. So um, Mulan is the one being uh, scheduled right now. But okay. Trolls uh, from NBC, I think, was released in April to, you know, one of just to, to go and basically do massive records on on uh, streaming. Yeah, I, I don't know, man. I mean, I you know, I've seen some of these, the rollouts of these like premium premium content on TV mm. with uh, iTunes mm. and um, and some of the pricing is incredible. I was like, I, I, I mean, I'm not a parent, but still, mm. I can't imagine spending. I mean, on one level, you save because look, you know, you, you're not paying for like five children to go see a movie, right? You, you're paying yeah. one fee. So so I get it from that point of view, but $19.99 or $16.99 or whatever, it's just like, I, you know, when we all know we can just wait until premium cable gets it, like HBO yeah. or yeah. HBO Max, whatever. So I wonder if this is going to be an effective <coughs> strategy that they implement long term. I suspect, who knows? I, I, I have my mm. suspicions, but... but it's, um, it's, hard we, to, it's hard to know, but then just, I mean, just seeing that example, uh, yeah. $124 million or whatever the quote-unquote box office was because it wasn't really box office but that that's yeah. a pretty big success um yeah. but yeah who, who knows if it's going to be massively replicated i guess we'll find out shortly when uh, mulan comes out yeah totally totally i mean yeah i, I sorry but i'm gonna have to wait until it's available on hbo max <laughs> you know so yeah 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 let's not get a coupon where you, you yeah. i can watch disney it plus free. though yeah disney, disney, plus. disney, oh, disney <laughs> plus right what was that? of course i mean i'm telling you man the, the, all of these these mergers and these this collapsing yeah, these yeah, companies yeah, yeah. will be i'm surprised we're not down to just two huge conglomerates at some point we yeah, will be i'm that, sure I'm but sure um gonna happen, who, who, and I bet you a tech company will be at the very at the at the helm of that, whether it's Google, Amazon, trillion dollars, whatever. We'll Possibly see. Possibly Apple. The, they have the money. Or Apple. It. Yeah, they have the money. You know, that's a whole nother conversation. I, I definitely have a point of view about like who will reign victorious in the content streaming world war amongst the tech giants. But um, but yeah, I don't want to get too off topic. Yeah. So I don't know. It's, yeah, it's no, but 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 it's, but it's it's fun to talk about for sure. You know, watching all this, this activity. Uh, as long as the consumers. I feel like I'm more of a consumer than a um, uh, a player in the market. So if I, as a consumer, if I, if I can win, if I can not have to spend tons of money on content, then I want that to happen, you know? So, so we talk, yeah. So you talked a little bit earlier, we talked a little bit earlier offline as well as online about this pre-sale business and finance through pre-sales and the model is collapsing. So just real quick, let's just do a quick uh, definition of what farm pre-sales are and then what that model looks like and if it is going to be changing, why? So I, I suppose if you, uh, we would take a pretty simple definition of a pre-sale mm -hmm. would be, um, the film is not yet made, uh, mm -hmm. you need to raise financing from various sources. You know, there's mm -hmm. obviously angels and angel investors, banks, but mm -hmm. in order to support those various institutions and to get the cash, um, having a pre-sale is, is a very, very important part of this for the major foreign markets um, mm -hmm. because your U.S. deal would, would most likely be in place or, or you know, pre-sales happen quite late on in the project. Even though it still might be a script, you, you should have cast attached um, and some financing in play to be able to, to, to get those deals done. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, you would go to the major international players, uh, France, UK, Germany, Spain, um, China, if you're lucky enough to be able to get a film in there. Um, so these big, big markets who are pre-sales, Japan as well, uh, who would buy films in advance of them being made, who would be happy to take those risks. Um, and we're not talking about big blockbusters. You know, we're not talking about Tom Cruise kind of cast where everybody would take it. It's something yeah. a little bit more... Uh, in a, in a range that's a little bit more, uh, could be a risk, let's say. Mm -hmm. um, and they would they would promise to pay you the money up front. They'd pay you 5% cash, and then they'll pay you upon delivery, uh, depending on whatever it is the, mm -hmm. the deal is um, negotiated okay. as. But that's pretty much the, the gist of it, let's say. Um, but before you continue, let me ask you. So if you're a, a filmmaker or a broker, entering into the pre-sales market should you be waiting for a film market to uh to to to, to engage a can of berlin or do you just do you do it as soon as you have the opportunity and have the ear or the attention of the potential you know distributor in that market 
Well, this is the thing. Um, I mean, this is where my opinion would be that it's probably more practical for a filmmaker to, mm -hmm. you know, let's say there's the hat of the filmmaker if you're the director. Mm -hmm. um, you're, you're probably more interested in getting the money back from your film plus make a little bit of profit. But you, are you going to necessarily want to start a, an entire sales team uh, in order to get access to the people who do pre-buy? Or yeah. are you going to work with a distributor that you, you know, like one person, so you have one point of contact? Because it's quite hard for you, the filmmaker, it's not impossible, but for you, the filmmaker, to by yourself go and find these uh, these channels or these uh, these distribution avenues in which to sell. It, it can be a little bit tricky. So I, yeah. I've definitely seen mostly that uh, um, a director would, rather than spend months and months and months building up this um, sales team, because you, you, you would need people who have experience, you need people who... So you wouldn't necessarily do it for, for the benefit of one picture. Mm -hmm. um, de depending on what, what the film is, you might want to just get a deal done quick. Um, mm -hmm. But obviously, if your film is in Cannes or in Sundance or one yeah. of the major um, major markets, then that's a different story. Uh, I just yeah. mean, you know, your, your run-of-the-mill production, um, mm -hmm. work-for-hire type deal, you, you make a movie that's just straight to TV or straight to DVD type then mm -hmm. yeah it would make sense to just set it off to a producer or to a distributor who would who would then do the sales on your behalf but with that with the sales agent again let's say it's a new sales agency that's mm -hmm. all kind of they're, they're trying to learn how to operate in this business would they be waiting for a film market to a, to to come into alignment or would they do it pre-market uh well i would sales? definitely uh do it do um so there's, if you take the markets, we have MIP TV, uh, MIP Com, which are big distribution markets, which take place mm. in Cannes in April and October, mm. normally mm. under normal circumstances. Yeah. Um, obviously, they were both can Well, no, uh, MIP TV is cancelled. MIP Com is happening in a in a smaller scale. Um, mm. But you you want to try and work in advance of those markets to find the right contacts in order to mm. maybe meet them there to mm. discuss what a deal would look like. Um, mm. But again, it's quite a big, it's quite a big okay. um, distribution type uh, event. So it would normally make more sense, I believe, if you if you would go there with um, with uh, a slate of films, not just the I one, see. but whatever the one project is, plus whatever the next ones could be. Yeah, um, yeah. To it, try it and sounds, garner interest. Yeah, it sounds like it's not too productive to, to take an independent film. I mean, one single film. Mm. And even if you have some type of financing in place and try to close that gap at a film market to secure financing without already doing the research. And if you did the research and you contacted and got connected with distributors, it's still not a productive use of resources to go there with this one film thinking it's just going to be a, a smart uh, strategy. Uh, yeah, I would say that the smart strategy would be to make those contacts and those calls ahead of time. Uh, just yeah. Because obviously a, a call could go at least a long way to knowing if someone's at least, is it, is it is it a complete no? Is it a maybe? Yeah, is it a yeah, yes right off the bat? Yeah, You'd yeah. have a little bit more of a feel for it. So I, I wouldn't, I would never go to a market blind. Yeah. Um, I would definitely try and do as much research as I can before about who the potential um, distributor you want to work with mm. is in what territory. And is there a sweet spot, budgetarily speaking, for pre-sale, engaging in pre-sales? For example, we talked a little earlier, like films between the 10 mm. and $15 million range are kind of in indie space. And so is there like a, a sweet spot that this is the number that makes the most sense versus this number is too big, this number is too small? Um, honestly, like I, I wouldn't know enough about that on the production side because, you mm. know, I, we're more used to, I'm more used to having a film mm. that's sort of, you know, here you go, that's it, that's the budget, go and sell. And then we would have uh, already made our pre-sales, so it would already uh, make a certain amount of financial sense for us to do that. Okay. But I would say that the films we work with TV movie-wise are mm -hmm. sort of in the million dollar range, no more, mm. a bit less maybe, depending on the, uh, on the okay, film. Okay. Um, so not, not a massive budget. The cast is normally not um, very, very well known. Yeah. Um, but then you know there used to be a time when you could do a good a good action film for for five million with a, with a Van Damme or that kind of that kind of guy yeah. which would work. But yeah. I think that ten to fifteen million dollars um, 
sort of uh, necessitates a theatrical uh, in uh, some kind of capacity. Uh, and that's sure. when, as we've seen with COVID, those screen slots or those um, those screens are going uh, mm -hmm. and will be more and more and more geared towards blockbuster releases. So mm -hmm. you might want to consider something more in, in as a VOD release. Uh, Uh, that kind of uh, level of of, uh, of film. Okay, But it's hard okay. to tell. Yeah. yeah, no, no, totally. Um, I get it. And then in terms of you know the pre-sale market changing, and we talked about this again offline. What will we'll replace it? I think what you pointed out just to quickly bring bring that conversation back into um, mm -hmm. the discussion is basically the pre-sale market will remain. In, in, correct me if I'm wrong. Will remain mm -hmm. a vibrant opportunity for certain projects. But for smaller yeah. films, the, 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 the 10 to the $5 million dollar budget films, it's going to be a lot more challenging, right? So I would say even for films with smaller bud budgets than that, which can be mm. niche, so which are going after a certain, a certain demographic, which mm. you know is going to want that movie, mm -hmm. that could still make sense. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just not seeing from our perspective a lot of, um, a lot of easy or... or, or um, avenues the way they were traditionally open to us yeah. for those for that kind of budget for anywhere between uh any, anywhere which we would consider to be um an expensive budget i, I would say the five to 20 million dollars is, is a is a very decent budget for which a theatrical release is probably um wanted that yeah. that's going to be a little bit more challenging at least uh, that's just my perspective uh, yeah and one of the one of the reasons you you shared was that the territories now want films that can definitely play strong in their markets right mm. they want films whereas maybe in the past you know you didn't need to have a film that did really well in france or really well in spain if it was a u.s title or u.s production but now because there's so much investment in these local local production and local and programming and creating things for local markets it's harder to sell these territories on things that aren't really going to do well in their market. That, that's, that's sort of my, my, um, my um, feeling about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I think that unless it's uh, something that's going to knock it out of the park, there's definitely you're being pushed into doing deals, mm -hmm. which, which are a little bit more, um, uh, you know, sensible let's say mm, uh, by doing okay. by pushing a little bit more of the local content because your own market is being uh, is growing massively you know around the world local content is growing in quite a quite a strong way so yeah. I, I, I i could see that that's sort of going to be an, an additional challenger to to those uh film slots so to the mm. screens in in whatever country we, we were talking about um, okay, okay. So it's hard to tell, but then they are having also increased opportunities to be uh, picked up by a Netflix type company um, yeah. to, 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 to be a worldwide, you know, because I think that would make complete sense if we, I think it was at Sundance this year that mm -hmm. um, I think Hulu picked up a rom-com for record-breaking 17 million, I think so, oh, Andy really? Samberg. I'm not sure if it's Hulu or, or another company but uh, yeah. so, and that was around you know if they sold for 17 million that must be the right kind of uh, price wow. for them so i think potentially those projects could be shifted to platforms um okay. but in what quantity is is hard to tell is, a, is that's a real question the million dollar question okay so let me ask you this so we talked a little bit about what's happening in the marketplace you know the challenges um whether it's the pre-sale market or financing distribution So where are there any opportunities right now that are that are beginning to open up in this international sales market that may not have been captured in the past, you know, and um, and and what are the what are the strongest, most vibrant markets these days comparing? Well, these days is, is kind of like uh, not yeah, accurate kind of, because, <laughs> yeah, so we can't even really use that as a basis. But maybe we think about it pre-COVID, I guess. But. But yeah, so growth opportunities that, that companies are beginning to seize or identify, and then maybe what used to be the strongest markets for uh, distribution and sales. Um, well, I mean, to, to be honest, I think that it's, again, it's, it's really, really quite difficult to, to um, talk about that in terms of, mm -hmm. of post-COVID because it's mm -hmm. just, it's going to be quite difficult to, to know when it's going to return to normal. Yeah. Um, 
and I think maybe with productions on hold, it's also difficult to know which uh, which territories are, are going to keep shooting or not, because I think that's going to change quite a bit with who allows productions to go ahead and who that's stops right. them. So I, I'm thinking potentially supply might be a little bit that might be a little bit uh, sh uh, smaller, obviously, okay. uh, in, at least in the few months, a uh, few years. To, to come the supply of films was getting so big anyway that yeah. it's probably it's probably um, an interesting thing to have that traditional films will maybe be uh, dif more difficult to make okay um, so I think yeah that's that's kind of a, a, a difficult point but I would say that the the um, the local content is where is where I think uh, a lot of these advantages are going to play for Okay. Um, so I Local think the content. smaller the smaller films um, will will really want to make sure that they play strongly in their own markets, mm -hmm. um, because the 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 opportunity obviously because everybody's competing for international distribution, and mm. there's only so few great 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 projects out there that are gonna get the international recognition they deserve. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm talking not 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 from US and Canada where. You know the films can be so strong because of the cast. I'm talking about like the gems, the you know the the brilliant film that's going to be produced in Kenya is going to mm -hmm. now be fighting against a fantastic film from South Korea, and the, oh, yeah. you know, it's going to be hard for them to get international recognition. Um, obviously, the Oscars now uh, uh, have for the first time uh, awarded it to a South Korean film. Um, but you know that's just going to add to the competition worldwide, and it's good news for us as viewers because we're going to get i think more and more daring projects in that space um but yeah in terms of the traditional way of of uh of sales i think that's that's going to be more difficult for them to to um come into our model let's say mm. of buying and then selling through all the tv channels around the world because it's just it's just such a um a product that's just not really there for that traditional market. Oh, I see. I see. Okay. Well, you, you you talk a little bit about you know comparing territories and consumer consumption in those territories and pricing territories. How do you you know decide the difference between eighty million Germans, right, who you're trying to price a, a project for, versus a hundred million English speaking Africans, right? Mm -hmm. Like, how do you how do you take Indiana Jones and figure out what its value is in one territory versus another based on the demo the the, uh, the demographics and you know the region? So it's really tricky because um, actually 80 million Germans, but 700 million English speaking Africans now. Uh, so it's okay. the Africa is wow. 54 different territories, I think. So that's one of the components we have to worry about. That it's split into four major markets. You've got uh, English, which is the biggest one, French, Portuguese, and Arabic yeah. uh, speaking languages. And obviously local languages is a smaller market. But basically that gets split up into those, first of all, those four markets. Then you took the example of English speaking. Um, yeah. that, that would be, again, 27 or 28 different territories that we have to worry about um, licensing individually to each of them. Yeah. Um, so that's already a massive challenge between German Germany as one country with with one licensing kind of uh, opportunity where you would license to one of X amount of clients. Here we have to deal with those X amount of clients in the 28 different territories with one or two pan regional players who would play pay TV to the whole market or a Netflix type who would be in all of those markets simultaneously. So that's a massive challenge in terms of um, actually getting the film to market mm. but then price wise there's so many different um so many different aspects that come into play uh, in my mm. mind at least because um you know things just ranging from what do people like might not be the same what's mm -hmm. the what's the spending power in those territories it, um, because it. obviously we can take that uh, poland is you know roughly the same uh, population wise as I'm, I'm just making it up but let's say yeah, Myanmar. Yeah. But they would okay. have a massively different interest in um, in um, in English films would be more interesting for Polish people than maybe for for the for the Myanmarians who would have their own uh, local content or you know so it's <laughs> yeah. all these different things that are a lot that of are variables. coming into play. 
an, yeah, an yeah. enormous amount of variables and unfortunately no um no secret weapon to price them um, yeah because obviously one, all these factors come into play but one thing you said i think is relevant for, for consideration for whether it's a filmmaker listening to this or a distributor i mean a, a sales agent for is like the barriers into the markets play a role in the pricing too, right? So, you know, not just the psychographics, the consumption patterns, but it's like, how challenging is it gonna be for me to get my product into that marketplace and then extract from it value, right? Whether it's a te technology issues, whether it's um, geography issues, you know what I mean? So I think that's a, and then also, you know, it, you know, we, we talked about this again earlier, which was basically, you know, the history of the transactions that take place in those regions is relevant as well. And sometimes the price is the prices you reach aren't really reflective of what the real value is because of other considerations happening between those people in the, in the negotiation and bargain, right? So so it sounds to me like there's a it's a real it's a it's it's a moving target, to say the least, right? In in terms of yeah. pricing. So you really can't it's I don't think you can probably you can rarely do apples for apples, right? Maybe if you're doing you know, the English and the Americans, you know what I mean? Like, well, this is what I'm going to sell it for in the UK versus the United States. But but beyond yeah. those close similarities, you know what I mean? It's probably extremely difficult. Yeah, I think very developed markets, especially English speaking markets, will probably mm. stay relatively the same with differences between each film because obviously the, 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 um, the cast is going to change, the, mm -hmm. you know, these, these kind of variables. But like mm. for like, um, it's not real there's no real mathematical way of figuring it out because okay. populations that could be extremely similar to each other uh, aren't going to have an impact so you know yes okay it's true that there are 80 million germans but those germans have a tendency to um watch english films uh, or, or american movies they'll mm -hmm. have a massive spending power so that means that the channels will be able to target um you know, people who, who, who watch the film and will spend money on it. So they'll be right in the spot where it'll, it'll make complete sense for an advertiser to, to be there. Um, and also the pricing for VOD will be more developed because there'll be, it, the infrastructure is in place for us to watch Netflix, Amazon Prime on any kind of device. So the price for them will probably be right, 10 bucks in this developed market. But then mm. if you take the example again of, of uh, of Africa, where the um, of English speaking Africa in particular, where the penetration of uh, smart devices, uh, internets, and all these kind of different things is is, is massively different. That's mm -hmm. going to have an impact on how things are priced and how people are targeted to to buy ads. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the the pricing is is just completely um, based on the track record yeah. of what 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 has that territory traditionally paid um if tomorrow the circumstances i mean the, the circumstances of every country in the world are changing anyway so let's say that 10 years yeah. from now the prices will go up or should go up in theory naturally mm -hmm. by by virtue of those countries economies growing mm -hmm. um so either way you know i think we sort of let's say that if i had to choose i would say yeah you just you just pick a place to start the best is really not is, is the best is really to try and get as much information as you can and okay. hope that you get an offer that's that that's pretty much matches what you want out of the territory. Okay, okay. Well, let me ask you this then. Um, so is there like a hierarchy or formula or litmus test for valuing US content for foreign licensing in territories that are very developed to make it easy to, to come up with this? So let's say US yeah. content in, you know, in Germany and France and wherever. And when I'm thinking about like the hierarchy, I'm thinking about the, the genre, the director, the lead actor, the production company, you know, so is the title from Lionsgate like high on the list of things that really matter when you take it to Germany? Or is it gonna be that the director is, you know, Steven Spielberg? Mm. Like, how do you, what's the... Yeah, well, I think that the, the um, to, probably probably to the audience, it, I, I don't know that many people who would really, um, go to a movie unless it's like a Disney film where you like you know what you expect or a Pixar where where the, the, brand, the branding yeah. is so important Lionsgate yeah. for example it's a sign of quality so when people see it at the beginning of the film they're like oh great it's a, it's a Lionsgate yeah. film I, I, I know what to expect I know I can expect something good but yeah. would they go to the movies to see a Lionsgate film probably not whereas right, I would right. 
go to the cinema to see a Pixar film or I would go to see a yeah. Disney movie because that's okay. their branding is set up that way. But then at that point for for something that's not a Disney or a, or a, or a Pixar, I think the end, yeah, the director comes into play massively. Um, if it's a Tarantino, then yeah, the sales do itself. Um, people will go and see that for him. Cast oh, is enormously important. I think that yeah, th- those are really just massively significant things. Mm-hmm. Um, from trying to get people to come into a cinema point mm-hmm. of view, right? You mm-hmm. need those. You need those big, big, big um, things to draw you in. But mm-hmm. what I'm more excited about myself as a viewer is that platforms now, because they have both opportunities, you know, mm-hmm. they, they pretty much get feedback from uh, all these different people around the world instantly on whatever they decide to play. Mm-hmm. Um, and separately, let's take Netflix as an example. They're creating content for the Spanish market. They're creating content for the French market. They're creating content for, you know, the US market. Or for, for, they're creating content for all these different pla- uh, places around the world. And luckily, some of it is fantastic and is actually making its way to eyeballs in the US and eyeballs mm-hmm. in the UK. So, you know, Casa del Papel is a good example of that. Uh, mm-hmm. I forget what it's called in, in I think it's called uh, Money Heist. Oh, yeah, um, no, yeah. Yeah, so that, that did phenomenally well in Spain. And then basically everybody caught on that it's actually fantastic. So, uh, you know, would someone have gone to see a Spanish film that easily? You know, okay, granted, mm-hmm. it's a series, but in a theater, whereas... Now with the word of mouth, um, a company like Night Night Netflix would be able to just push that on you and yeah. take a bit more risks with content from around the world um, because they know that you might like it. Simply put, you know, we're, we're not all all of us not not necessarily going to like blockbusters, even though they're great films, and that's all that's being made right now. Some of us do want to have those fifteen million dollar rom coms. There's a massive market for it, just not in the same avenue as before. Um, I so I think they're, they're the ones who are ideally placed for the future to bring some fantastic films to market. It's funny, Casa de Papel. List. Yeah, no, no, it's a really good point. It's funny when you mention the, the Spanish title versus the English. It's uh, your House oh, yeah. of Money, Casa de Papel versus Money Heist. It's always interesting to see how, because obviously you need marketers that understand not just the language of the territory you're taking it to, but the culture what's going to yeah. really resonate more versus another. Well, we're rounding out our conversation. Just a couple, of, one or two remaining questions, more fun. I mean, is there a series out there on whatever service or film that you would have loved to have been the broker to sell it throughout the world? So if it is, what is that series and, and or TV or film? And I'm just curious, where would you have taken it first outside of the, the market it's coming from? That's an interesting question. Um, I mean, what, what I watch personally, I think yeah. are, are really only films that uh, series that could have made it on platforms. You yeah, know, things like I just finished watching Umbrella Academy, which just came out I think yeah. a couple of days ago. I'm not sure where you would sell that necessarily uh, that easily on a TV station, at least from a worldwide perspective. You wouldn't really get it on on a free TV station because the violence and. But mm-hmm. you see, those are the kind of things that I would love to have more of them made. Um, mm. But then, yeah, I think probably probably something like House of Cards would have been uh, would have yeah. been not not easy, but would have been more traditional to distribute. Mm-hmm. Um, it fits in a little bit more with um, with a sort of the, the normal way that that you would air a series, even though it, okay. it was released in in a in a different fashion. That's some, mm-hmm. sort of something that I think would have been more sold traditionally mm-hmm. than uh, some of these new shows, which are crazier and, and um, more violent, but it's what the people want, but it's probably not what the broadcasters want. Well, where, where would you have taken House of Cards if you had it? Um, first place, well, first I, mean, I think you, 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 could probably, you could probably take it to a lot of national broadcasters would have, would have taken it. Um, I know that the U.S. Is, it was obviously broadcast traditionally, so to speak, before mm-hmm. I think before Netflix. Yeah, but yeah. Um, on on a, on a worldwide scale, you would take it to to um, you know various people. But I think it would have been a national broadcaster type thing. It would have been prime time for sure um, in a lot of in a lot of territories. Uh, so you so you could have got so you, I think what you're also saying is look you could get could have got that top dollar for it by taking it to the major. Uh, markets and then national broadcasting services and sold France, Spain, Italy, Germany, 
all at the same time and just really, really did well with that. I mean, I, I have no idea if we would have gotten uh, more money or not than what they made. I obviously don't know. I, I, I don't yeah. think, so. probably not because, you know, they, they had a massive hit. But I'm yeah. just saying that, like, that's something that I suppose would have fit in more with, with the type of content that we that we were used to, at least. In, in, I, see. I see, I see. Well, no, I mean, this is uh, this has been a really, really enlightening conversation. <laughs> yeah, Ooh, bless you. Me. Thank you. Yeah, you know, we don't get a chance to talk very much to, you know, people in sales because oftentimes the folks that do that, that kind of work, as you mentioned earlier, behind the scenes, you don't know the companies, especially in the, in the international space. Um, you know, on the most of us in, in my business work on the domestic side. So it's really enlightening to hear what that world looks like and, and also kind of um, get, you know, relevant information about what's happening at the moment in the market. But right now, I know in Monaco is probably close to like eight o'clock, I guess. So I'm cutting it to your dinner yeah, time. What is up. it? Yeah, yeah, but, yeah, yeah. So I want to cut it to your dinner time too. Well, I'm sure you have an exciting night on town at the Monte Carlo, maybe. You know what I mean? <laughs> no, I think I'm uh, taking taking it easy, uh, oh. getting prepped for, for probably for the weekend. You know, uh, of course, of course. Th things are things are quite quiet these days. Actually, we we have a lot of tourists scattered around mm -hmm. the south of France, but okay. um, people tend to be avoiding too much, uh, you know, uh, midweek partying. I would say. Wait, you know, unrelated, did you guys actually come to the office throughout the whole COVID thing or were you guys shut no, down? No, 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 no. We were all working just... from home, um, mm -hmm. except one or two of the people in operations who needed to activate the servers and keep everything running smoothly here. Yeah, but they were by themselves, so avoiding contact. If not, all of wow. us were working from home for three months. Wow. Um, but now we're back full time. We just have to wear the masks in the yeah. elevator. And that's about it. The way you have to, it's not you could, yeah. it's up to you, but... Um, and what do you think will be the first market you'll be visiting in person? Any idea what that looks like? It might be MIPCOM at this point. Oh, okay, um, in October. Okay. Yeah, but on a different scale, I think that um, we'll see what the what the organization ends up looking like. But I think mm -hmm. it's going to be very different than how it normally is. It's normally thirteen thousand people um, wow. meetings with you know different people from. 9 a.m. till 6 p.m. Then you have a drinks. Then you have a dinner. Then you go out on the town. So um, that's that's not going to be possible um, for 13,000 people coming from all over the world. It's oh going to be a little goodness. bit difficult to to um, oh, operate wow. that usually. So uh, yeah, we have, we'll have to see. But I'm I'm hoping that's going to be the first one because I'm you know I'm uh, looking forward to getting back on on the road again, so to speak. Yeah, and it's right in your backyard. Um, yeah, this one's close by, so it's not much yeah. traveling involved. So. With the exception of MIP though, do you have a favorite market? I really like, uh, so I love the MIPs because you know, it's just, it's a buzzing market. That's where a lot of business gets done. Yeah. Um, I love ATF in Singapore, just cause it's a, it's a pretty good market. It's also a lovely place to go. And yeah. Discop in Johannesburg. Johannesburg yeah, is a really, cool, uh, a really cool place to go to and have a good time. And uh -huh. you know, the, the people are so nice. And I mean, that's one of those things where I, where I feel so lucky about is that, uh, I've managed to visit so many different countries and, you know, mm -hmm. meet so many cool people um, as clients and even other other sellers, you know, uh, competitors who are become friends. Like, yeah, I think that's sort of the really nice part of, part of the business that I've been lucky to 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 get. Wow, that's great. That's great. Yeah, no, hopefully, you know, you get a chance to experience that again very soon. And yeah, um, hopefully, so. Believe me, I'm, I'm just as excited to try to do that as well. I really was looking forward to doing some of that international travel um, this summer as well as coming up in the in the fall. But uh, but I guess we'll all have to wait and see what happens. You know what I mean? So yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, listen, appreciate you taking the time. This has been incredibly informative. I really value the insight. And um, and hopefully, you know, we'll get a chance to do some business again really soon. I know we we, we attempted to on a couple of occasions, but the the, the, yeah. the the stars didn't align just perfect. But I think that's going to change in the future. Yeah, I we'll hope. get there. So sure. We'll get there at some point. I'll be a client. Well, at some point, we'll, we'll, we'll be able to look like, so what, show me the reports, Michael. How much money am I making this quarter? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so big, big as good for that to happen. But um, but we'd love to have you back uh, after, you know, things have changed and we can get, get even more updates. And, uh, and if, Anytime you want to stop in on the book and boardroom or in my classes, feel free. Just let me know. I'd love to have you. Thanks so much. I really appreciate you having me on. And thanks to all the listeners out there. I mean, um, my, it's actually my first time on a, on a, on a podcast. So I'm honored that oh, it's really? uh, yours. 
Oh, well, listen, I, I appreciate that. This is probably going to make you a household name, so be careful. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, you know what I'm saying? Get you from behind the desk out into, you know, pressing some flesh, meeting some people. So, um, but uh, but listen, c'est la vie, monsieur. You know, have an amazing evening. I don't know if my, my French is not as great. My non, German could be better. Fait. Okay. <laughs> ah, merci, merci, merci beaucoup. Merci you know, beaucoup. Deutsch, right? So I can be <laughs> some Deutsch as well. But um, but anyway, so listen, this is uh okay. So Michael Greenwood, Green, Greenwood, Daryl Films. Uh, wish you all the best. And if you want to see more episodes, Brooklyn Ballroom, go to the website brooklynballroom.com, or obviously you can find us on YouTube at the, the Brooklyn Ballroom or social media bklyn uh, dot boardroom, and uh, we're here to help. So listen, wish you the best, Michael, and uh, stay in touch. Cheers.